Hey folks, Joseph A. Sabora here. You're in for a very special treat because I'm going to be reviewing a satirical modern day fairy tale that has romance, comedy, action adventure, and more. All fit into one storybook. And that is the most popular and famous movie, The Princess Bride. It's actually based on a novel from 1973 by William Goldman who also wrote the screenplay by S. Morgenstern. <laughs> and this is the 25th anniversary edition that came out in 2012, which is just uh, a re-release of the 20th anniversary edition, even though that came out in 2007. But the Blu-ray came out in 2009, so that was two years late. <laughs> But they re-released it just so they can add um, just one more feature to make it up for this release. But, chances are, <laughs> you get what you want, or at this rate, as you wish. <laughs> uh, yes, and it has all the features right here. Um, All in an Eagle Box case, but what can you do? I do have this on DVD as well that I picked up back in 2006 at Albertsons. That's a special edition DVD from 2001. Yeah, I mean, there's been several copies of this movie everywhere you go. There's also going to be a brand new uh, Criterion Collection release that's coming up on October 30th of this year. So it's going to have a new 4K remaster with all the extras from the Criterion Collection Laserdisc. So, but this is the MGM release as we all know under the distribution of 20th Century Fox which interesting enough was also the company that did release this movie in theaters with Act Free Communications, the yeah, Norman Lear's production company and Rob Reiner directing this. But a solid cast right there, you know, with the names of Carrie Elves, Manny Patikin, Chris Sarandon, Christopher Guest, yeah, Wallace Shawn, uh, Andre the Giant, yes, and even Robin Wright. Plus you also get Fred Savage and <laughs> and Peter Falk joining in. I've seen this movie many times. This might have been the film that did introduce me to fairy tales. Even though I did watch Snow White and the Seven Doors, all these Disney animated fairy tales that we had that I always watched as a kid. And I had watched the TV show Grimm's Fairy Tale Classics and so on and so forth. Um, but this movie really plays itself. I mean, the fact that they use this as sort of a satire, so they they took the material and they, they threw a lot of stuff that, that just makes it so funny. And who couldn't forget all the memorable quotes in this movie, such as, As You Wish, or Inconceivable, or how about this? Hello, my name is Ingo Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. <laughs> yeah. All these lines alone just make this movie special. So, yeah. And just to think, this was um, his follow up after um, films like This is Spinal Tap and The Sure Thing, and of course, um, Stand By Me, which is based on a Stephen King novella. Because um, Rob Reiner's been known for you know, playing the Mike Stibbick, which Archie Bunker calls him Meathead you know, from the TV show All in the Family. And, well, at least he got to work uh, together with uh, Norman Lear to, to work on films like this and shows. Also, just to keep this in mind, this wasn't a huge hit when it came out on September 25th, 1987. I wish it was. But it developed a cult following over the years, you know, when it was on home video. And since then, 
people never got tired of it. I mean, people had quote this movie. People remembered it by heart. People had a fun time watching this without getting bored. It's just special. It really is. So, anyway, let's get to the review. It stars Carrie Elves, Robin Wright, Chris Sarandon, Manny Patikin, Christopher Guest, Andre the Giant, yep, the WWF wrestler who's no longer with us, but he would always be remembered. Wallace Shawn, you know, from my dinner with Andre. Uh, Billy Crystal, yes, he's been in a lot of stuff. I mean, he's he's a comedian, as we all know. Uh, Carol Kane, uh, Peter Cook, Mel Smith. Marguerite Mason, Malcolm Story, Will I Be Gray, along with Betsy Brantley, Fred Savage, who later went on to do The Wonder Years, and Peter Falk from Columbo. <laughs> yeah. It's written by William Goldsman, and it's directed by Rob Reiner. The movie begins where we meet a little boy who's the grandson who's played by Fred Savage who's just playing video games coughing and just laying in bed he has all this other stuff that he got in his entire bedroom yeah a lot of action figures even Captain America has a Cheetos bag <laughs> all of that just a childhood's uh, dream come true right there but then his grandfather came by yeah, his mother um, suddenly came in and, and invited him inside just so he can actually read him a book as a present. And the book is called The Princess Bride. Yeah, it's a story about, as we begin, where we see a beautiful young woman named Buttercup, who's played by Robert Wright, who lives on a farm in a country called Florin, where she orders a farm boy by the name of Wesley, who's played by Carrie Elves, just to do all the chores for her and just to take care of everything that he does. And he just says, as her command, as you wish. So. And all this time, she begins to fall in love with him. But he decided to leave his fortune so they can marry, but unfortunately his ship is being attacked by the dread pirate Roberts. And Wesley was to believe he was dead. So five years later, Buttercup has reluctantly agreed to marry Prince Humbledink, who was played by Chris Sarandon, you know, one of the, uh, the most evil prince of them all to the throne of foreign and then she plans on killing herself yeah committing suicide but then she left she decided that she doesn't want to deal with it until she was kidnapped by free outlaws yeah, a short Sicilian boss named Bazzini who's played by Wallace Shawn a gigantic a giant from Greenland named Fizzik who's played by Andre the Giant and a Spanish fancy master named Igno Matonya, who is played by Manny Patikin, who actually seeks revenge on the six fingered man who killed his father, who actually waited 20 years to finally get his match. Yeah, that's where we get the line Hello, my name is Igno Matonya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. <laughs> okay. So anyway, the outlaws are being pursued by a masked man in black and Prince Humberdink um, and several other of, of the soldiers were going after them. So the men in black suddenly catch up with them. You know, they, yeah, they went up on the ship. Um, Buttercup was going to jump off, you know, just to escape from the free outlaws, only to find out that there was a a giant eel that's ready to attack her. Yeah. So she came back to the ship 
and so they finally went straight into the cliff of insanity. Yeah, they climb all the way up on top, and the Men in Black suddenly catches up. Well, Ignigo just cut up, cut the rope, but the Men in Black was still on the cliff. So he climbs right all the way up with the help of him, and then that's what leads to a sword fight. Yeah. <laughs> but the Men in Black just knocks him out at the end. And um, then he goes after um, Fesnick. Yeah, just where Fesnick just takes the, you know, the brick and. Or, yeah, he was taking one of the bricks and started to throw at the men in black, but then, well, he started to push him on, onto the wall until suddenly he got knocked out. And next, well, Benzini suddenly uh, kidnaps uh, Buttercup by uh, tying her up and even tying her up with a cloth all the way into her eyes. And then, the um, he challenged uh, the men in black to uh, drink the wine that happens to be poison. Well, yeah, this is where he was doing this trick, but he actually switches glasses to see which one has the poison, and the other one is just as it is, <laughs> normal. Well, he begins to realize that, yes, both of them were poisoned, so, well, so he tries to drink one, but it looks like he was just... He drank the whole thing, but it looked like he's, he isn't. So maybe he just uh, imagined he did. Um, so he drank it, and, and then... <laughs> and then he just... passed out and died. <laughs> just like that. Inconceivable! <laughs> yeah, he does say inconceivable a lot, too. Every time. So it goes wrong. So anyway, he takes Buttercup as a prisoner, as they flee just to stop at the rest of the edge of the gorge. But when Buttercup correctly guessed that it's the Dread Pirate Roberts, and suddenly she actually dumps him all the way down to the cliff. And yeah, they, they started to fall all the way down, and this is where he says the line, As you wish. And then she began to find out that it was Wesley because all this time she thought that he was dead. So he went all the way down and found out. And so yes, it was Wesley the whole time underneath the men in black suit. <laughs> so then they went all the way down to a forest that's very dark. It has a fire swamp. It even caught uh, Buttercup's dress on fire. Then we get somewhat of a quicksand where... Um, Buttercup suddenly fell, fell all the way down, and and Wesley tries to to save her life by actually grabbing the vine and you know, you're grabbing that vine and try to go all the way down uh, just to to save her, and they finally got out of there. And then we get all these giant rodents that started to attack them. That big, huge, giant rodent that looks like sort of a close between a possum and a rat. But either way, they, they attacked uh, Wesley. They're trying to stop him. And then at the end, um, yeah, Buttercup uh, came to, to knock it over. And, and after they finally stop it, because already uh, Wesley's already been hurt, got caught on, on his shoulder and his arm. So now he finally takes the sword and stabs it several times. Yeah. But that is until Chris Humbledink and along with the Sims, the Six-Fingered Man, and the rest of the soldiers were going after them. So they caught them out. Um, they knock uh, Wesley unconscious. So, and by the way, the sing the six finger guy is named Count uh, Ruggin, who's played by Christopher Guest. So, so he wants so Wesley wants up in a torture chamber where 
he's being completely tortured by having to fill tons that what they had to fill with all that um, that water mill so they had to pour all that water so he can go all the way up to it so that way he'll be able to lose a lot of strength and he would actually die from uh, from all that when which it did actually happen when Prince uh, Humperdinck uh, suddenly puts him all the way up to 50 instead of 1 and he suddenly screams in agony just just as everyone else had heard yeah so then um, um, Igna Matonya along with Fesnik had came by uh, Indigo started to attack all these soldiers and suddenly got knocked unconscious a bit. Wow, they both reunited. Yeah, Fesnik and Ignigo. So Ignigo suddenly helps him by you know feeding him some soup. Didn't work. And then afterwards he starts to wash him with three buckets of water. <laughs> So now they're becoming the heroes. <laughs> so they're about to go after uh, Wesley, only to find out that yes, he was in the torture chamber. So by just when the um, Ignigo just uh, brings his commands uh, for his sword, you know, trying to uh, talk to his father, and he goes directly to where the torture chamber is. That's when they found Wesley. So, only to find out that he's mostly dead, <laughs> they took him to uh, Miracle Max, who's played by, you guessed it, Billy Crystal. <laughs> he also has a wife, who's played by Carol Kane. So he just decided to uh, find a way to um, help Wesley by, you know, putting that, uh, one of those, um, one of those uh, briefly, um, you know those ones that they use, that machine that they use to uh, just to blow out um, all the fire from the fireplace? Well, yeah, that was the one that Miracle Max have gave him. So, <laughs> so he helped them out and also gave him a uh, a chocolate type uh, miracle pill to see if, if this can bring him back to life. And it only takes like. I think a couple minutes or maybe an hour to have him recover. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> have fun storming in the castle. You think it'll work? It'll take a miracle. <laughs> yeah, when both Miracle Max and, and uh, his wife just <laughs> just uh, greeted them. So when they finally went to the castle, um, they're about to go after Prince. Um, Humpledink, uh, along with uh, Count Ruggen. So yes, uh, <laughs> Indigo finally gets his match to go after him. And this is where he says the line over and over again. Um, and I'm not going to say it <laughs> because I know how it is. I always repeat myself too. Yeah, I mean he got stabbed um, twice in, in the arms. But uh, the knife that he threw went straight into his stomach. And then at the end, you know, he had trouble trying to get up until he finally, you know, has his strength to, to finally continue to, to um, sword fight um, Count Ruggen. Yeah, there were a lot of fencing sword play in the movie, so it really helps. So at, at the end, um, so now Indigo finally had his chance to defeat Ruggen by stabbing him twice in the arms, just like how he did it, and actually uh, slay uh, his face twice, just like how he did it before a long time ago. Um, and then <laughs> he finally stabs him at the end and just says, I want my father back, you son of a bitch. <laughs> there you go. Well, Buttercup was ready to marry um, Humpledink, but, well, she gave up. I mean, she thought that she got married, but 
Unfortunately, she didn't say the last word, I do. So, which is true. And she was ready to kill herself, you know, taking the knife. But then she spotted um, Wesley already in bed, you know, already feeling very weak, but starting to recover. And <laughs> until Hubba Dick came by, and, and this is where he was about to say, to the deaf. And he said, <laughs> And then the Wesley just says, no, to the pain. And Humble Dick says, I'm not familiar with that phrase. <laughs> and he just explains at the end. And then until he finally says, drop your sword. He did. They tied him up. And now they finally escape. Yeah, I mean, Buttercup jumps all the way down into um, Fiznik's hands yeah, since he already bought four horses for them um, Indigo and Wesley all jumped together as well so they all they all left in the horses and they live happily ever after with Wesley and Buttercup together kissing And yes, there's several scenes where the grandson always interrupts while his grandfather is reading the story. <laughs> yeah, of course. Just a wonderful modern day fairy tale that just never gets old. It's always remembered from time to time. It's a timeless classic and it always remained this way. I love the cast. I mean, they were definitely the right choice for them to play those roles. Um, definitely love Carrie Elves too, uh, playing the definitely like a a free part role that he was given. I mean, even though it's simply Wesley, um, but he was very handsome, charming, sexy, athletic. And it shows. I mean, this is sort of like a take on uh, Douglas Fairbanks Jr. when he played the role in that sort of way. I mean, he wore the mask and he wore the suit, so it was just like that. Uh, Robert Wright couldn't be more beautiful than ever before, and she definitely was when she played uh, Buttercup, yeah, the Princess Bride itself. Um, even though she's an American actress, uh, she was given a a English accent, just like how Carrie Elves is. But it was perfect and amazing. Um, but yes, she got Chris Sarandon playing the villain of Prince Humpledink, who wants to marry uh, Buttercup. So you know how that will happen. I mean, they even plan. Even they were planning on killing her too. Then you get Andre the Giant, who was this huge at the time, when he was alive. I mean, he was very lovable. Not too bright, but nevertheless, I mean, he wasn't evil. I mean, he was, he was very kind, gentle. He's like a teddy bear, <laughs> in a way. But he was cool. Um, and Wallace Shawn is just totally, even though he was only there for just, uh, for the first half of the film, I mean, I guess you could say he, was, he kind of stole the show a little bit <laughs> um, when he keeps saying inconceivable, the way, you know, he acts, because he's so tough, I mean, <laughs> I mean, he's like smarter than, than the two guys that he, they took as partners. So. And of course, Manny Patikin, you know, very athletic too, very strong, and yeah, not too bright either, but he's, but he knows he wants to seek his revenge on, on the six finger man who killed his father. So, but at least, you know, he'll have a good life afterwards. It wasn't easy. <laughs> and you're gonna forget Billy Crystal as Miracle Max. I mean, he was totally hilarious. Underneath that makeup, I mean, it's hard to believe that was him. I know people said it, it would have been Mel Brooks underneath it all, but it's not. 
which is interesting because uh, Billy Crystal did want to have Mel Brooks to play the role, and that would have been interesting because uh, I could definitely see Mel Brooks having a fun time playing the role, just like how he played uh, Yogurt in uh, the movie Spaceballs. So <laughs> there you go. But yeah, um, solid cast. And I always love the moments, you know, when they started to read the story. I mean, you get Fred Savage always interrupting and always trying to criticize and trying to figure it out. And he doesn't like uh, the kissing moments. Yeah, we know how kids are at the times. I mean, you know, people are not interested in that. But at the end, you know, he didn't mind, mind it that much. So. Uh, <laughs> and even that moment when the Buttercup had a dream, a nightmare... Uh, <laughs> you know, he, he even began to find out that, no, um, Buttercup wouldn't marry uh, Prince Humbledink. He would go to Wesley. Because, you know, he thought that uh, the grandfather actually read it wrong because they're just going back to the same scene as before. <laughs> but we know that it was just a nightmare. And the grandfather just tells him, okay, you're very smart, now shut up. I love all the comedic humor with witty dialogue that's thrown into the story that you never seem to forget. I mean, it works so well on so many levels because you can tell this is exactly what a satirical fairy tale should be. Even though it, it they did market it that way with uh, a lot of romance and also action adventure with the art of fencing that they put into with uh, between the scenes of of the sort of play of both Manny Batikin and Carrie Elves yeah, in, in the scene where they were on top of the cliff of insanity. Yeah, I love those scenes. I mean, and the way some of the rocks from the cliff starts to come all the way down. It looks so real. Um, I find it amazing, though, that the film was actually shot on location at uh, Shepperton Studios all the way in England. Even though, yes, there are scenes that they were shot at a sound stage, you know, like the fire stomp scene and all of that. Definitely has some hollow darkness into it that they put in. Um, I even love that moment, too, where you have Andre the Giant as Fesnick actually in disguise, and you know, they're just doing a plan just to go save the girl, Buttercup. Where, <laughs> you know, he had to wear uh, a cape all around, and and both um, Indigo and was uh, and both Indigo had, uh, as well as Wesley, decided to set uh, the cape on fire. So he's like, <laughs> like he was ready to scare him off go after all these soldiers. I thought that was really funny. Wow, I mean, th this was just such a fun movie. Um, I love the score by Mark uh, Nafier. I think that's his, how you pronounce it. He did a wonderful job scoring the film. I mean, it definitely has the fairy tale touch to it, with all the characters and, and the story that went into it. Um, I love that song at the end credits, um, very good song, um, yeah, Storybrook Love, I think that's what it's called. And with films like The Princess Bride, we had other films like Ever After a Cinderella Story with Drew Barrymore and Doug Ray Scott, uh, along with Angelica Houston, <laughs> yeah, which is uh, a modern take of the Cinderella Story. And then we get films like Ella Enchanted, <laughs> and uh, Enchanted with Amy Adams, you know, take on Disney animated uh, fairy tale classics. And of course, Mirror Mirror, a take on Snow White. And then we had other films to follow that joins in, even Stardust for that matter. It was based on a Neil Gaiman uh, novel. <laughs> Think about that. I mean, so without The Princess Bride, we would have never had any of them. That would be totally inconceivable. <laughs>
And Rob Reiner did a wonderful job directing this film. It really shows that he had fun with it. I mean, he was a big fan of William Goatsman when it comes to writing all these books. And this was one of them. <laughs> and I have a feeling he does love fairy tales, so that's exactly what he was going for. Plus, it is a movie about um, a grandfather reading a storybook to his grandson. So, it really shows, because you know, we were little kids, you know, we always have our families uh, reading stories, especially bedtime stories, too. I mean, we never get tired of that. It's like, it just makes us fall asleep so that way we can dream and be able to remember everything. Like you're actually living in a fantasy world that, unlike any other. <laughs> yeah. Know that about it. Um, very wonderful um, satirical modern day fairy tale that that you can watch over and over and over again um, anyway I, I watched this movie many times ever since I was a kid I remember renting this on home video um, I, I know my family rented this a lot and they they watched it all the time and then we would later watch it on HBO and other channels so it's like whenever this movie comes on we watch it I would do the same too, yeah, especially now that I have the Blu-ray and DVD of, of the film, so that's cool. Uh, so anyway, um, it's a fun movie, check it out, um, find a copy everywhere if, if it's available, and have a wonderful time. Uh, and also to keep this in mind, the, the Blu-ray that I picked up, the 25th Anniversary Edition, which I know they've been re-releasing this many times already, it has a solid transfer that looks even better than ever. And I'm sure the 4K remaster for the Criterion Collection will be just as good. So, but still, <laughs> I'm cool. So anyway, that's The Princess Bride, and I give the film five stars. But I see it again, <laughs> as you wish. <laughs> I'm Joseph A. Sabora, and I'll see you later. Bye.